Hi, good morning. Uh, sorry, I did. Hi. Okay. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. A snapshot, a snapshot of, uh, of Dr. Helen there. So um, good morning. Welcome, uh, everyone, to the first We Edgy broadcast of 2022. And we are delighted to welcome Dr. Helen to join us this morning. Dr. Helen is um, an executive leadership coach specializing in education. Um, she is going to tell us a bit about her story today. Um, and we're going to talk a lot more about uh, coaching about bravery in leadership and um, a little bit on some of the uh, globally competent uh, skills frameworks that she's developed in her um, book. So um, uh, without further ado, I'll bring Dr. Helen onto the screen um, and uh, let's start. Let me find how exactly to do that. I immediately forget as soon as I've done it. There you go. Here I am. Yes, yes. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good I'm very well indeed. Very well. How are you? <laughs> We're very excited to have you here. I know that um, Vic obviously knew you before, but I met you for the first time at Guest this year and was just absolutely, uh, probably overly excited when I heard you speak. So it's really, really lovely to have you here. To <laughs> oh, to thank you. Well, I loved your energy too, Philippa. I loved it. Like both of you, Vic and Philippa, I just, and I think what you're doing is fantastic. So it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. And as Vic said, you are up nice and early. And obviously, we'll keep retweeting this out so that people can watch it so that other people who are waking up at a more reasonable hour in the UK can watch it later. But also, I'm sure people that you've worked with across the world will be able to watch it whenever um, they have some time as well. So, so that's wonderful. And anyone who is online and watching us live right now, please remember that you can add chat comments into our chat and we will be able to ask them to Dr. Helen at the end of our chat. Um, so just so you know, we also have Linda Parsons in the background and Shazia Saeed in the background as well, who are going to be retweeting and commenting. So please, if you are talking to us on any of the social media channels, then do remember, ask questions. We can feed them back into here and we can ask them directly to Dr. Helen towards the end of the session. So um, one of the, the big things that we kind of wanted to do in terms of having We Edu Breakfast was obviously bring to the forefront some incredible women in education and talk about what they've done. Um, and one of the things that we found the most interesting and the reason we do the We Edu Breakfast is actually about how people have arrived at their uh, current sort of platform in life and sort of positioning and what you're doing and the passion that's driven you towards there. So our first question is, what is your We Edu story, Helen? Well, before I even answer that, I want to say that when well, you talk about incredible women, every woman is incredible. Every woman leader is incredible. And that's, so, that's what's so important to, to, to think about. I always say we're just all completely normal, which is often our go-to position. They say, oh, actually, no, just normal, just normal. Or else we just say, yeah, no, actually, do you know what? We are all incredible. So let's this morning go, yes, we're all incredible. And with that in mind, so just an equally incredible then. It's an equally incredible story. So what is my story? Well, now it's a post-school leadership story because I led schools for 13 years in the UK and Australia. And actually for the past eight years, I've been um, working in uh, international leadership recruitment. That's how I've come across quite a few people. That's why um, I've been in Dubai recently, uh, helping recruit for international, you know, senior leadership roles in international schools. Plus I do a lot of coaching of leaders uh, across the world. And I do have a, um, a very, very kind of, protective of now my portfolio career so I do a lot of board roles as well and consultancy um, and speaking as well particularly about leading from the heart things that I'm genuinely interested in and we can talk a little bit about that uh, uh, as well mm -hmm. but bearing in mind it's a post leadership story so what brought me to it well I think education's always been important um it's uh, I suppose I was, I was a Sunday school teacher when I was 12 you know just the, the, those little things that, that that come in mind I remember when I was at university thinking I, I want to do something that's meaningful you know that's yeah. really important um and and just I, I, I fell into it slightly in the sense that there are there are summer jobs teaching and residential courses and and you do that you think yes you know that's great and in fact i would say teaching on those that was where my leadership really really developed because when i was a teacher 
Um, then still in the summer holidays, I was maybe I would become assistant director of studies and then the next year director of studies and then course director. And, and so so you learn about all of that as you go. You're learning leadership in all sorts of ways. And that really helped me for when I became a deputy head. So I started off, fell into the independent sector because I was state school educated, been to Oxford, but then fell in. Uh, then after that fell into the um, independent sector in the UK. And uh I remember very early on, uh, my first school, thinking, hang on, it was a boys' school actually at the time, hang on, these um, students, they're, we're bringing in students from, um, you know, international students, and they're not actually teaching them any English. And because I'd been teaching English in the summer holidays, I remember going to the headmaster and saying, I think we should be doing this, I think we could do this. And, and so I sort of just created this little niche of being like, head of EAL, you know, just there, um, right. just because I thought it was really important. And anyway, I was only there for a couple of years, became head of department, then head of department, also deputy head, and then head, um, because I was only deputy head for a short time before I had to become acting head. So I was actually head by the age of 30. Um, and that, um, and that, but that's quite funny, actually, in many ways, because I remember really clearly at the time, somebody saying to you, somebody mm. saying to me, yes, but your head age 30 you know what are you going to want to do when you're in your mid-40s and I remember going, oh, oh, sorry say that again Philippa this is a question that comes up quite a bit and actually I'll, I'll really quickly just pull you back to oh, something no, as well right. is is just the question of that is is well why does there have to be something after that and, and what who knows what's after that is yes. my thing but I think that's incredible because I, I do find it quite strange that you can be in such a position of clearly very well deserved because of the amount of, of work you put into yourself, but also into, into education, that somebody would question that in terms of, of like, that, that why would you, you know, well, what if you do that? Well, why would I wait if I can make an impact now? And that doesn't seem to kind of sit very well. But what I was going to say was all those different things that you've done, obviously, they will go onto your CV and things like that. But did you ever find or, or do you find that that within this women in leadership leadership positions generally with anybody do you find that people need to have those kind of i've got a certification in or is the experience and the fact that actually hands-on tangible experience in those roles makes you that leader and makes you that person who who does know and has an, an influence on that sort of sector or are you finding now that the things that you're kind of coaching people into it is very much a case of well if you don't have this certification you're not qualified and you couldn't possibly do that no, and, and do you know the the well, there are so many answers to that question. Yeah. But having um, experience above all really, really matters, and showing that you're prepared to go beyond really matters, and that's that's really the only way to forge forward right to, to just keep to push yourself I don't mean push yourself overly much but but yeah. seek out opportunities and sometimes I think that's about listening to to yourself and thinking what's right and pushing it forward mm -hmm. I mean you've written Philippa and I know when when I I, I write and I, I, I'm not a, a great writer that books are not my my big thing I just but I write because the the voice is there and you think there's a space there's a gap there's something that needs to be done and so yeah. that pushes forward equally I think that should be the case in schools now having a certificate is good I would say um, for a couple of reasons one is that as long as it's the right certificate when you're mm -hmm. using that term very broadly but as long as it's, it's one that you have that you feel genuinely interested in yeah. then yes absolutely mm -hmm. do it and it is a stamp and it is a mark and, and I found that with my doctorate, actually. It was something I felt I had to do. It was about taking it further. And, and I did my doctorate, and it was ages ago now. It was back in, well, it was such a long time ago. So I remember writing it up when my now 18-year-old um, was six weeks old, and I'm kind of typing and rocking in with my foot. You know, I remember that yeah, very wow. much. <laughs> yes, yeah. You know, don't forget those things. Um, but but that, and it was because it was important to it, and it's taken me further, and it is a mark, and I'm proud of it, proud mm. of that. But that's not what's made me the leader. The lead, the, what's made me the leader is, is doing it, making it, it work. But I will say, and this is really, really, really important, the biggest and um, most important element to all of this is believing in yourself. Mm. absolutely yeah. believing in yourself because that's what holds people back and that's what I see so much in my coaching it's one of the reasons I went into coaching you know so it's been eight years since I've been a, a, a principal and and one of the reasons I went into coaching as part of my portfolio is to help people understand that and we have to remind ourselves as well you know yeah. even as coaches you have to remind you coaches you have coaches you know just um but you it's that 
that's what's going to take you forward. And there are so many things, and particularly still for women, there's so many things that 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 batter against it. I say, oh no, you can't do that. And so many assumptions and so many. And we're talking about millennia of of expectations, which we're mm-hmm. still having to 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 move forward in. So mm-hmm. that that driver and that belief um, is so important and supported by other women. Yeah, and that's a daily reminder as well. I feel like the yeah. sort of imposter syndrome, I think it comes up on most conversations that we have in yeah. uh, We Edu and even amongst our little group of uh, founders yeah. when we're chatting on WhatsApp, you know, we have to sort of remind ourselves and each other um, yes. that actually you know, we're very capable of doing whatever yeah, our absolutely. next thing is that we're terrified of. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, no, I completely agree. And it does come up all the time. And I think you, I and it, it, I sort of hesitate to say it's, it's not, a, it's obviously not a uniquely, female thing but I'm assuming that you do see this in women possibly to a larger extent than men can you tell me about that yeah I, I think I do well I do definitely see that yeah. there and for all sorts of really understandable reasons like it's mm. not it's not it's not their fault it's not our fault um there are uh, so many structures built in which which make it harder for women I mean, I have had three remarkably similar conversations with people over the past um, just couple of days about how they'll manage having children and and being a leader and 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 sometimes that that sometimes that makes me cross I'm still having mm-hmm. to have those conversations. Yeah. Um, other yeah. times, and, and, but one of the messages I've been giving is, you know, this is about you and and you and your choices and um, and women's choices there. Equally, there is something which I think we all need to do still, which is to sort of pick up that that flag and help move society and the world forward. Mm-hmm. And I know that's hard, and we shouldn't any of us feel obliged to do that at any time. We're not sort of mm-hmm. say go out and. You know, rampant march now. It's not that, but it's just. Isn't that what we're trying to do in schools? Help you yeah. help children develop and make the world a better place. And Definitely. you know, we've got that responsibility as well, each of us. And and it's just that bit harder because it's not expected as much. It's not. It's not practiced mm-hmm. much. When I think about it. So my grandmother, who's, who's not alive now, but she was born before women had the vote in the UK. So it's wow. like well, she was she was born then. Then if you think about the influences she would have had from her parents and so on, mm-hmm. I mean suddenly it's only it's only a, a it's not even a hop, a skip and a jump, it's like a mere, mere hop back. Mm-hmm. And suddenly we're back in the 18th century with 18th century attitudes. That said, all through this, I do believe that education has been important. When you look right back mm-hmm. in the education um, of, of girls, too, in yeah. certain mm-hmm. strata and so on, it's, it's always been there. So it is there. Education mm-hmm. will out, you see. Education yeah. is the answer. You know, that's what we've got to think about. I still think, I mean, I still see a massive difference with the way that, uh, you know, girls are educated now compared to the kind of differences between the girls and boys' education. Even when I was a child, yeah. I still felt mm-hmm. like there was a divide yes. and there were things that I... Um, that irritate me to this day about the way that I was treated as a you know as a young girl versus a young boy in my school the things you could and couldn't yes. do the sports and things mm-hmm. that you did and didn't play because of girls and boys which has already changed massively and I'm hoping that I mean I'm hoping this group will be around forever but I'm hoping my daughter's my daughter's six I'm hoping that by the time that she's my age this this will feel completely different again because she won't know you know even what um what I went through um, yes. Uh, should we talk a little bit about, um, so one of the things that we were talking about um, in before the chat was talking about, um, well, you, you talked about um, the, uh, well, the importance of being coached and the importance of coaching yeah. for international educators, international leaders. So tell us, I mean, everybody, what's the, what's the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. who needs it? Yeah. Why, why, why is it important? Well, I actually, I do think everybody should have a coach. I mean, the first experience I had of coaching was when I was a school leader. And for me, it was transformational. And actually, it was not just transformational for me, it was transformational for the school, because mm. it's it was about taking me forward, because otherwise, you only know what you know. And what coaching does is it helps get inside and show you, you know, even more that you don't think, you know, so it's getting yeah. into that, and it's helping empower you. And it's it's very much about you. So you can we can learn every, uh, all sorts of things, you can learn by reading something, you can learn by going on a course you can all of those things and we should keep learning and we learn from other people coaching is about going deeper and I I feel so passionately about that in fact I think if we think about it just from a school leader perspective I think people need coaching into school leadership as Mm -hmm. well so that help that kind of understanding and that's that's from a very early stage in their career and and it could be partly about um what are you going to 
uh, you know, what kind of uh, role are you looking for? What, what actually really matters to you? Because we can often think that we know what it is we want, but when we really look yeah. at it, we, what is it we really, really want? So coaching can really help with that. I think, and so coaching into leadership, coaching through leadership, through, through your time, because Every school is different. Every day is different. Every minute is different in school. Mm. And we know that. It's it's yeah. also different. Um, equally, there are some strands through that. And, and being able to ask the right questions around that's important. And then also coaching out of roles as well. Because there's one surefire thing. You are not going to be in the same role in... 80 years time as you are now I mean you know hopefully we'll still be around then but but you so people are going to move on so what does that look like and of course we love the moment when things are going well in school we absolutely love the moment we can't imagine anything different mm -hmm. that's fine that's great but where where are you headed your life is too short not to make the most of it and I think that's what coaching really really helps you doing do and it's that getting in underneath and asking those questions and I did do about certification I did train to be a coach I was coaching before that I trained yeah. and I practiced a lot and um yeah I'm quite a challenging coach actually I <laughs> say yes but with that's reason you, yeah with you, reason. you want it that way you don't want someone to no, no you're not there to yeah. stroke it, it's stroke egos and then you know, uh, no, no. right. <laughs> Good. I do find that quite an odd concept being coached initially. I know obviously lots of people talk about coaching now and and previously I, I don't know, perhaps when I first started teaching 13 years ago, I would ne I'd never heard of that really. It wasn't something mm. that people did. And if they did, it probably was very quietly done. Um, mm. Did you find that quite a, an interesting concept or were you quite like kind of ready for it as a, in terms of a person and then becoming a coach yourself? Yeah, well, I think for me, it just made sense. I just followed that pathway. So again, it's about listening to those voices and so on. And what I'm talking about, when I was talking about coaching just there, I was talking very specifically really about executive coaching. So that one-to-one -one coaching. Coaching is a term that's used really, really broadly. And mm. we talk about a coaching culture in school, which is great, you know, asking people questions in order to get their buy-in. It's a great ask coaching questions. So sometimes, you know, I start to feel a little bit less um sure about it when people talk about performance coaching which is more like sometimes it's it's about really telling people what to do and it's like yeah. I'm not so sure that's really coaching but you've got to be a bit careful around it people I like the terminology it. though that's uh oh, it's, yeah. yes yeah it's it's it, it just depends on how people use it so it's mm -hmm. the the if if you're absolutely helping somebody develop who they are and develop their performance that's right if you're using that as a way of just saying, look, these are your targets, here are your KPIs, um, tick them, and, and we're going to check yeah. on that, mm, less sure. So for me, it's perfectly natural, Philippa, to answer your question. It's a natural yeah, story. and I think I think exactly what you've just said is is unfortunately the way some people are taking it. And I have heard mm. from schools you know, leadership numerously talking in that kind of style where it's as opposed to having your termly check-ins and the things that you're going to be improving on. You know, every teacher kind of has their targets for the year. It might be normally academically driven, something pastoral, and then something for their own development and growth. And that has now become something they're being coached by somebody who traditionally would just have been their, their mentor or their line manager or mm -hmm. somebody like that. And so I think you're right. There is a, a, a hazy line in terms of, of how that's mm -hmm. going to be developed because from my perspective, it's very much, like you say, the executive coaching side of it, where it's more of a one-to-one -one system. And you're really digging down into the things that are, are potentially barriers for what you are able to do and become. Um, and I think for me that, you know, what we were talking about earlier is actually having people that can help you to see past your own brain mm -hmm. and your own mm -hmm. thoughts is really, really helpful. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, we invest in children in school all the time. That's what we're doing. We're spending our time doing that. We do need to invest in in, in staff. And yeah. there's a cost associated with that. Of course it is, because there's a cost associated with working with any professional. Um, and then, and so the balance is there, how much are pre people prepared to invest in, in mm -hmm. their staff? Equally, how much are we prepared as individuals to invest in our in ourselves when i i mean i funded my doctorate entirely by myself because i wanted it to be my doctorate you know it wasn't yeah. that it was being paid for by somebody else or i was doing it or i would have to um do things in a certain way because of of somebody else was paying for it there's that sense of we should take ownership as well yeah. of, of yeah. us and our route and, and it's not just about school and the next job it's actually about our life pathway there. Mm. 
So, yeah. and that's where coaching takes you. Thank yeah. you. What is it you really want? Yeah. And, and sometimes you might not know that until you have those conversations with people, right? So going back to your We Edge You story, um, you're obviously an incredibly um, able leader and confident. And how has that kind of taken you? Obviously, you've spoken about having children and, yes. and obviously you've had headships. You've had international headships, which is incredible. So kind of what was the pathway to those? Um, because it's like you look back and I think, because I always think, and this is, this is one of the reasons I went into coaching is to help people not think necessarily in this way. But you think you fall into things, you do things because they're right. Equally, I recognise that I did it because I felt really strongly called to it. So um, I'd done my first headship, moved to my second headship. So I was headhunted for my second headship in the UK. And mm -hmm. that's where I had my children. And, um, and for me, it was just it had that, that call to have children as well there's that 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 mm -hmm. sense that drive that's there and and I didn't know how it was going to work out I didn't I didn't know that that but I wasn't I just did it and in fact and this is this is shows what schools can be like so this was so my son now is 18 so we're talking now 19 years ago um probably a bit more than 19 years ago so I was offered this uh, um phoned up and I was offered this this second headship by the chair of governors who was um you know he was a grandfather white haired qc you know all of these things and he offered it to me and i said thank you very much it was on the phone thank you very much now can i tell you they want to be starting april i said could i say perhaps it would be better if i could start in september rather than april because um i'm going to tell you now that actually i'm expecting my first child now to give him his absolute I mean, absolute credit. He said instantly, no, 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 no. He said, start in April, work as flexibly as you like, um, take time off when you need it. Uh, you know, obviously we'll keep paying you and um, you'll be a great role model for the girls. It was girls' school. And and that's like... That's amazing. Wow. That is amazing. That is amazing. That, and that's how it should be. Now, it, it's not always that, it wasn't always that straightforward in school because sometimes you, 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 when you have the, the baby, I mean, he was absolutely fine, but then there mm. might be a couple of other governors who go, oh, you know, maybe you should be around more. I work really hard. Um, <laughs> and I work really hard as a part as a result of that because you think, yeah, actually, this is great. And I, I look, it's like you are proud of it. If you have a child, it's like, look what I did. Look. <laughs> baby but what I did is <laughs> <laughs> and, and so stay with us I've got three children and that's um you know that's so uh, those were barriers in many ways hurdles in other ways yes I work really really hard and I actually I do think that you know anything that's worth doing you need to work hard for yeah. I don't think that it it happens otherwise and sometimes you know sometimes you think how am I balancing all of this but mm. you do because you can and mm. and you just you know, keep on pushing through and that's where it's important to keep coming back to what's important what's right mm. and that sense of being morally driven by by that so yes hurdles on the way don't you think every day in school there's a hurdle because there's something not right or somebody's not happy or you know all the lose a block or something, you know. <laughs> oh the lovely things that happen as well yes absolutely <laughs> well, can i can i ask a, a, a question i guess it's because it's quite like close to my heart i i had my first child when i did my pgce and mm. shock horror to everybody you know you'll you'll never make it as a teacher now and da, 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 da. um and i used to he he didn't feed in the day and i had to go back really early when he was really tiny and i he wouldn't take a bottle goodness knows how many we tried but a part of me felt very under pressure to, to prove that it wasn't going to stop me. And I got promoted within that year, which was great. Mm -hmm. But equally, I. I... Oh, has she oh. frozen? Yeah, I'd love to fill in the end of that question. Like, yes, yes, that's right. Yes. But a bit about being having to prove yourself. I think, yeah, there is a pressure, I, I think, to prove yourself. Um, and, and that is that there. Anyway, is it there particularly because we're women? Um, possibly, possibly. Mm. Um, should it be there? Is it helpful to some degree? I mean, mm. it, it may be helpful. If you again, I always keep coming back to students and thinking, we want them to feel proud of what they're doing. We want them to um, want to stretch themselves to 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 prove themselves, not in a way that tips over into 
you know, negative mental health in any way, mm. but in a way that strengthens those muscles. So I, it is a it is a fine balance moving through. It is a bit of a tightrope, isn't it? Walking on, but I just I think that's that's just probably what life is. That that's yeah. there. And we've got to make sure that we're doing it with enough of a smile and a positive kind of sense of going forward um, and being supported when we like wobble one side of the tightrope or the other. So mm. yeah. I do think that that that's there, and that's it's probably okay. It is okay. It, it's it's getting that balance, um, but that's what we're striving for. I think that's um. So we, I think we we'll probably touch on having babies in most of these uh, in most of these uh, <laughs> conversations as well. I realise. Um. So um, if we're talking about uh, schools who are investing in coaching, so I know you've yeah. worked in international settings mainly, so that means probably fee-paying schools. Yes. Um, in the most part, in the most part, um, where maybe there is more budget for this kind of thing. But um, I mean, tell me how it differs between, um, I guess the the leaders that you're coaching in international school settings. Yeah. Tell me about um, is it is it different to the UK? Is it different in state versus uh, versus international education? And yeah. um, what what do you see as those differences, or what, why do you think some are able to invest where others can't? Um, so, yes, there is a question of budget and having availability of budget. Um, more important, however, is the attitude to it. And if we were looking at a, a whole school setting, you've got to, con you've got to when I'm talking about contracting, I'm talking about contracting with a kind of coaching um, term. So I, I'm on to talking about um, coaching and, and, and contracting in a, a general um, <laughs> general terms. So if you're talking to school, then probably what we might be doing that well, because I work with a number of other coaches as well with LSE education. And what might do is we might have individual one-to-one -one coaching with the most senior leaders, maybe some group coaching with senior leaders, and, 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 and maybe that, that helps them therefore be able to work with um same middle leaders so the, there may be um a, a number of different elements to to that we, we work with individuals so i mean i work with quite a few individuals who come forward separate from the school so they're school leaders but actually they're trying to find their path they're in a a, a period of transition in their lives or they're they're mm -hmm. trying to work out you know, what is it i really want to do next so how do i make the most of it how do i balance things how can i be the best of myself you know, and then they might have a, a series of a, a few sessions of, of coaching but coming mm -hmm. back to the school what's really important is the the understanding in the school of how important mm -hmm. this is and mm -hmm. and that feels like a bit of a mission for me to, yeah. to help schools understand about the importance of investing in leadership because it's not short term this mm. but so mm. much is seen in short term ways mm. and, and you can kind of understand that a little bit because you've got budgets um and you've got to you know meet your mm. ebet da you know you've got to you, you could, all of that um but there's something we need to step back mm. and think that this is is really this is long term. It's also it's transformation transformational for the individual. It is transformational mm. for the school, and moreover, it's transformational for society and other schools and beyond. And I think we have that bigger responsibility to that. That's the harder ask. I know I'm going to keep banging on about that, and people aren't suddenly going to go. Oh yes, everybody thinks that. Yes. Um, but but you know what? Yeah, okay, fine. I'll keep saying it because it's true. That's the thing. Yeah. So. Absolutely. We have to be relentless sometimes, don't we? I know that I bang Absolutely. my leadership tech mm. role. <laughs> yes. <said>. yeah. <laughs> it's about forging ahead. It's it forging is. ahead. And, and, and very similarly, you get you you have those things of like you say, it's very short term. So things like ed tech, oh well, COVID's over, so it's gone. And actually, no, you know, in the same sense of things, it, it should be part of our future planning of education yes. and, and the way that we're driving forwards. And yeah. and coaching and, and making sure that we have that holistic approach to, to people as well as our students. We talk a lot about how the school is very holistic and the approach to teaching and learning. And, and actually, you'll find that quite frequently the, the teachers don't feel that the same is given to them. And I think that's exactly where people like you come in. Mm, yes, I think yeah. it's especially hard if you are talking about international education, where a lot of changes in schools are, are driven by parents. And so, you know, is is this on parents' agenda? You know, is this on their customers' agenda that leaders yes. are being coached and things like that? And you know, it's unlikely. It's probably. But it answer. depends. You see that it depends there because it depends where the parents are coming from. And because I mean, I can't think of a single FTSE 100 company where the CEO and senior staff are not coached. Absolutely. Actually, and so so if we look at it from that perspective, it does depend where parents are coming from. But you're right. And if you speak, if you talk through with parents, they say, of course you should invest in staff because we want the best staff yes. for our, our um, children. But they, but parents often aren't, aren't asked those questions. Or as schools, sometimes we, we actually keep that barrier. We keep the kind of the mystique 
of staff mm. and, and teachers and leaders away from parents yeah um because we're just trying to put forward it's like the the marketing hype you know it's all marvelous and wonderful and uh, and and so on and, and as teachers we're just running around serving and mm. and i think there is a more grown-up mature conversation to have around this uh, with with parents as adults yeah. uh, in, in this but if we we can infantilize parents sometimes i think by by pushing away and thinking that they are they're not to be involved because we can see the the issues that happen mm -hmm. if, if that's allowed to go unbounded but mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, bottom line, we're, we're all grown ups. So let's yeah. try and have grown up conversations about it. Um, I know it's difficult. There's so many um, rhythms and, and yeah. things and that we rehearse all the time. Especially in international education, where you have parents mm. from just all over the world. So their, their yes. perspectives on things are, are always going to be yeah. so different. And, and it's hard yes. in certain contexts to share that mm. amicably with everybody. Yes, yes. That's, that's right. Really yes. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned the FTSE 100. It's, it, do you think there is that disconnect, though, between education and industry? Because I know that I I do. I think yeah. that there, there is a lack, and it's been in the news and things like that, you know, yeah. as incredible as things like the NHS are and wonderful, and they're being praised and, and yeah. not quite yet being given the money they should be, but they it is being recognised. Yet, yeah, actually, teachers who have flipped their lives upside down to help educate the world over this during this pandemic and yet there's still not that gravitas towards education and the yeah. change that's needed to be invested within that yeah and, and again maybe that's the thing is that do people see it as okay we need these really great strong economies but where do the economies come from in the beginning is yes. kind of <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with you. Absolutely, totally agree with you. I think that that um, as schools, uh, we we are often we're, we're it's like, oh, you're only a teacher. It's only a school. Oh, it's only children. It's like, and part of me feels it sort of brings out the toddler in me slightly. You know, you know, so that I'm kind of wanting to stamp and you know kick people's shins or something. I don't know what it is, but but it's like, okay, take away schools. What will happen to the economy then? Do we think? You know, it's when you do that. But I, I also think there's a little bit. So here's a challenge to the profession that we need to be able to to stand up and 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 talk really strongly and positively about what we do, mm. and and uh, and say this is why it's important. Um, because obviously people haven't got it, even though they should have done. And I can understand why. So because it's, it, there's there's an element of people remember schools as they were when they were at school, and sometimes yeah. they see them through the eyes of their children. But they're only seeing often they're only seeing it through the eyes of the primary schools. So very, um, and yet they don't see the complexity of a, a, a primary school classroom. They're just seeing the work that comes home. Because by the time it gets to secondary school, you realise that actually you can't control your children. And they don't want you in schools so you don't find out what's going on um but there's a that we we need to be able to show that the amazing work that's going mm -hmm. into learning and and how people learn and, and the mm -hmm. fact that we are constantly self-critical is a positive a positive mm -hmm. in there whereas other people in in other um professions and industries regard this well, you can't be good enough um if you're constantly being self-critical so so i think there's something there again about us not being afraid to say this is quite straight you know this is straightforward it's one of the reasons why so in my portfolio and the board that i'm uh, boards that i'm involved in they're not all education boards so i'm involved in a couple of um i sit on the boards of a couple of membership organizations for financial um professions and yeah. and they're uh, being able to share what it is that I've learned about learning and um, be able to do that in a way that is quite straightforward. I have the confidence to do that because of the independence. I could mm. I could do something and I could walk away from it. I need yeah. to you know, build that up. You know, and that's been hard work building that up over eight years, but and keeping building that up. But being able to when you have the chance to say that, you recognize people go, I didn't realise. I don't, didn't realize that's actually what's going on in schools. I didn't realize there's all that research, yeah. constant mm. research into how we learn and yeah. how we, we develop people and the society. So I think that's, there's something there that that we've all got a bit of responsibility to be involved in. Yeah, and I actually think that the coaching elements of things are something that can really empower that and actually get teachers to go, you know what, yeah, I'm going to tell people how great it is and what we do and why we do it. Because yeah. like you said, you know, um, cognitive development of students parents don't think of that they think oh they're you know they're just drawing a picture or singing a song or they're you know they're not thinking actually yeah. 
there's so many different skills that go into that mm. and the development yes. stages that students go through mm. and even all the way mm. through um up to when you know when they're at senior school and, and then graduating mm. and things but the, the compounding effect of all of those yeah. little parts of education are so important yes and, yes and the fact that teachers are still investing in themselves I mean teaching seems to be one of the you know professional like certainly I have never really done might like to do a master's at some point but you know like I'm not constantly investing in my profession my mm. leaders aren't mm. so constantly well they're not my boss is a lovely man but you know is they, they're not constantly investing in my development whereas teaching is mm. just like you say you're talking about goals and one of them is personal mm. development goals and things like that I mean um like I say it's somewhat self-serving because I work for a teacher training company but this is where I see that um teachers are constantly being invested in and teachers come to me and say I want to do yes. more I want to take this qualification and it's just sort of even if it's just small steps they're just you know they always want to find a way to be a bit better which I don't mm. think is absolutely I mean like I said a very corporate background is definitely not true for sort of the kind of environments that I've worked mm. in in the past mm. absolutely mm. Um, should we touch a little bit on um, some of the themes in your book? So can we talk a little bit about um, your uh, globally competent school? Um, and I know that um, I might leave it to Philippa to ask some of the technical questions about uh, what that means yeah. for curriculum and in school as a non-educator. Um, but I would like to talk about what it means about around sort of future skills and things like that. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, the, uh, so I've written a couple of books and, um, and the only reason I write books is not because I am a writer. I, mean, I do write and I write regularly and I write a regular blog. But I write because I want to communicate and I write because the it feels that I should write I really want to communicate um something so and I, I and it's part of this this breadth what to do but one of the things that I focus I've focused on over the past few years and I feel very very strongly about is actually but it was about social mobility first of all and about um the the uh, everybody being able to have and every young person ultimately being able to have access to opportunities and I realized um a, a few years ago and I think particularly after working uh, internationally I realized that actually what's really important about that is global mobility it's global competence mm -hmm. because if you're you're in your own local area and that's what you know you will have some opportunities if you're prepared to travel you've got more opportunities if you're prepared to connect culturally and and um so emotionally and and with a sense of of the 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 wider world you have even more opportunities so the more opportunities you have the more likely it is that you're going to be able to be socially mobile so that yeah. made me start thinking about global competence and i realized when i started looking at schools and and think about experience of that 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 I mean, so many schools, I mean, we all say, don't we, that, you know, we're, we're, we're you know, global citizens. That's what we're doing, creating global citizens. And then you ask the question, how? How are you mm. doing that? Started looking at that in a little bit more detail, um, just sort of on the side, you know, along with other things. Started thinking, right, okay, so, so actually I think there are three there are actually three levels of school here. And so I created this model, which is what I put into my, my book, the uh, uh, absolute, um, you know, uh, terribly exciting title, you know, the globally competent school, colon, a manual. Show the book, show the book. Oh, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, yeah, there yeah. we go, that's it, yes. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> somebody said to me when I wrote it, when she said, oh, it sounds like a real page turn, so you said, are there any murders in it? <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, it's about the, um, uh, so, but, and, and it's, I, I deliberately wrote it, I wrote it not to kind of create something that you've got to, to have me come along and do anything with no this is designed to be simple you read it um, mm. and then you go oh yeah aha yes and let's go and do it let's go and do it yeah, so the these ones as well that you can stick sticky yeah. notes into and be like i need to go back to that point there and that's yes. really great yeah and it's this one deliberately isn't long the one i wrote because i wrote one um a few years ago which i don't have to hand actually but it was about powerful schools how schools can be drivers of social and global mobility and that's much longer um mm -hmm. but then half of that is about practical ideas because that's one of the things that I like doing is creating ideas. I, I don't like being limited by what other people have said works. That's yes. not what they can do that. That's great. And it's great to have research. And I'd love people to go and do research. That's not my role. My role is as a catalyst. That oh, it's about yeah. the catalyzing of ideas and so on. Anyway, it's about the, the true coach there. That's absolutely yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just about how we, we 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 know we've got to know who we are, don't we? Yeah. In, in that. Mm -hmm. So these three levels are about the level one is is about actually what I think most schools do really well. You've got it in the curriculum, you learn about tsunamis in Japan, you learn about um you know, you've got flags and festivals and so on. Level two, however, is that little bit more of getting that more of a buy-in and, and having uh, connections. And that's where you've mm -hmm. got visits and connections. But level three is when you've got 
deep engagement, the co-creation of curriculum. You're working with partner schools, that, that ease of actually being able to walk in other people's shoes. And, and that's one thing I, I don't think even schools groups are, are not doing in the way that they could do. So that will be my challenge to, to people. I mean, I've summarized it really, really um, quickly there. But it's that how do we really help people doing it, do this? Because like you could say, um, think about the UK context, people might say, oh, no, of course we're globally competent. You know, it's, it's you know, we we, we have a um, an, an exchange to, to, to Germany that happens, you know, every every 17 years and it costs uh, 37,000 pounds to send okay. one person on it and two and a half people go on it. And it's like, well, that's not really easy. So what's the yeah. opportunity? And one of the things I learned by doing that as well is that we should shouldn't say what the school does is what is the experience of the child and young person what's their experience, the experience of every single one of them now that can be slightly different that's fine that's how we need to audit actually yeah. so that would be my challenge there around shifting that and um, so it's not the list on the website but what's the experience of the child really and I can only imagine how difficult that is for in young people as well, because I feel like a lot of that sort of empathy, like you talked about walking in other people's shoes, comes with experience as well and comes mm -hmm. with sort of living it. And I feel like I'm only I'm not even really there, you know, at the age that I am, where I find I find it really difficult to sort of picture it. So I can't imagine putting it into a young person's mind in the same mm -hmm. way as well, because it, a lot of it does come with experience. Actually. But they're really resilient and they mm -hmm. really recognise things. And I remember um, one of my children saying to, to me at one point, in fact, I was just travelling to London. This was before the pandemic. I was just travelling to London. Um, but I... I would travel to lots of other places before and she said to me mommy she said um w w w uh, what time will it be um there uh, compared to here so it's like she's already got a sense <laughs> it's just london so actually it was the same time zone but yeah. she got a sense that i was working in other time zones in different parts of the world so yeah. she had that aged about four or five mm -hmm. and that sense of it and and she had uh, already had the sense that people speak different languages so it's quite a multicultural school and yeah. it was at the time so and i think you know actually that exposure can happen and we can help that mm -hmm. happen. Yeah. And, and so yeah and it's very, I, I definitely like I think because I think about the international schools here obviously we have so many different curriculums and so many different agendas and things like that but mm. how do we how do we guide teachers to be able to understand how to to teach that I guess what kind of like because there is a huge skills gap like we've I've spoken about it in, in a few of my blogs as well it's there's definitely this this kind of loophole of things that that are missing and and how do we how do we plug those gaps to make sure that we can support children to have that that future and that understanding um I mean is there any kind of top tips I guess for schools um the first thing is absolutely genuinely believe in it and that's where it's that aha moment that yeah. if you think without global competency we're not going to get social mobility now i can just mm -hmm. say that but you've really got to read it through and think it through and i think mm -hmm. when you once you have that once you know that you can't go backwards there's um, a really interesting um scale to the milton j bennett scale about cultural um uh about cultural intelligence cultural understanding and and what's really interesting about this scale is that so you start at one level where you 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 don't know there are any other cultures and um, mm -hmm. and then you go up and you realize there are other other cultures but actually you know ours is better and then you go a little bit further and go oh well actually maybe well, there is something equal there and then you go even further and it's to the integration but what's really interesting about this scale is a one-way scale you cannot go back yeah. And I think that once you know something, you can't unknow it. And the yeah. most important thing to do is for us really to know it, because our children in school learn from our values and what we really believe in. And if we believe in something, it will come through. And then also we can have that power to shift things and change things um, in the curriculum. We believe in them as people. Um, we we believe, if we're not modeling us believing in ourselves as people, yeah. how do we help them believe in themselves as people? So it's, it's all of these things that, that connect. Um, and that's kind of, that's really exciting. I mean, it's really exciting and it's really energizing. And then you think about it too much, you think, oh, better go and lie down in the dark and drunk. <laughs> So much to think about <laughs> but at least someone can be taking it forward <laughs> do you I like think you created a cosmic circle then for this webinar yeah. you came back to believing in yourself there as well I like yeah. that yeah. do you think um the international schools potentially have a bit of a leg up on this then because if I think about the schools yeah. that I've worked in you know 74 different nationalities 85 different yes. nationalities incredible like yes. to the point where even I would say I didn't even know there were that many nationalities you know <laughs> yeah. crazy um yeah. and and they you know really embrace it and we have so many different yes. days and and things that we want to be able to do to share those different yeah. initiatives and, and information and and also just yeah. I mean 
just to like give us more like anecdote of when I first started working at one of my the schools here. And I remember going around, I was on lunch duty and they were all, they all had their packed lunches. Now my recollection of, of lunch when I was a child who took egg sandwiches into school. Every so is <laughs> yeah. what happens when the child brings egg sandwiches in, right? Like, oh, you know, they stink blah, 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 as you go. So you end up, the child doesn't want to bring them anymore. I stood in this classroom with children from all around the world who are incredible. And some of them had sushi, some of them had, beans in a jar like some of them had sandwiches and like little pack ups and all the rest of it and there was so many different cuisines I felt like I was at a buffet mm. and the children and I'll say pre-pandemic definitely were literally saying oh what have you got oh that looks really nice oh I've never had that before that's really interesting and they were sharing and like you know you have to be really careful obviously like share yeah. food yeah give yeah. it a go <laughs> um yeah. and it was incredible and I've never yes. experienced that mm. in a school yeah. because mm that just doesn't happen you get mm. that mindset of mm. that's different to what I have mm. that must be horrible and mm. I just thought that was incredible yeah. but so it can be done absolutely can be done. And there's yeah. hope for humanity there you see but, but we know that we know that it's there developing but it, it doesn't happen people. in every school and how mm. do you get to that level especially if you don't have that many different cultures and, and, and nationalities mm. within the same place. And, you know, you would hope that in places like the UK, where, they, again, the schools are just vibrant with, with the cultures and, and mm. nationalities, but I don't think that's the same mm. perspective that they get from that. It definitely people need, edge. people need to learn. You need to go. Teachers are so, so powerful for the future of the world. And it's, mm -hmm. that's why it is so incredibly important that, that teachers, leaders, schools actually understand this and understand, like I said, just about the, the fact that this is so important for the future of our young people. We've got to overcome all sorts of barriers, barriers around racism, barriers around about that kind of protectionism, the, the kind of nationalism, all of those different things. But we mm -hmm. can do it. And do you know what? Here we are. We we three of us here. We all believe in it. There are loads yeah. more people who believe in it. So let's go out and make sure that everybody gets that. Everybody's Absolutely. there. And in terms, I guess, of going back to that skill set thing, is there anything that you would kind of recommend? I know um, Linda in the background said things like the IB framework, obviously, which is definitely something which is looking outwards into the world and communities, but also things like ISTE and and then there's the global goals. And uh, is there anything that you kind of would say to teachers if they were just starting off thinking, you know what, actually, my school needs to change and we need to make that and I'm going to kind of pioneer that in my school setting. Like, What would you, is there anything you'd suggest? Well, personally, I really like the global goals because it's, it takes you out beyond school. But it's not that that really matters. What really matters is what's inside you. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what really matters. It's about you as a teacher really understanding and believing in that and having the confidence to be able to, to take that forward. Because if you've got that, actually, we can do mm -hmm. anything. Yeah, definitely. No, I totally agree. Beautifully put, absolutely beautifully put. Look, um, we are running over our 45 minutes now, so I will slowly wrap up. But Helen, you've had some absolutely wonderful messages during this, and I feel a little bit more special today because of this conversation, I really do. Um, so thank you uh, so, so much. Um, and to anyone who's listening and uh, to Philippa and to Dr. Helen, um, I've had a really wonderful time talking to you. So thank you so much. Thank and you. until the next uh, broadcast. Oh, uh, Philippa, you were talking about the Middle East... Uh, teachers conference yes. sorry the Abu Dhabi teachers conference so if you are keen to uh, connect with any of us obviously we have uh, Twitter Instagram and um, LinkedIn that's the other one um, and obviously on the YouTube channel you can watch back any of these breakfast uh, we achieve breakfasts with these amazing women of of all of the amazing women the ones that we've chosen to speak to I'll say that <laughs> um, but we are also <laughs> at one of our first live face-to-face -face events so we did guests uh, last year and we have several coming up but the first one where we will all be there together presenting will be at the Abu Dhabi teacher conference which is now being held in May so we will tweet something out a little bit later about that and about our attendance there and we're very excited and also keep an ear out on our socials because we are going to be having some afternoons um, afternoon teas and coffees and little meetups with people generally in our local areas so please 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 keep an eye out for that and share it with anyone who you think might be interested in just kind of connecting and talking about all sorts of different topics to do with education and being a woman within that sector. 
All right. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Helen. Bye. Bye.